Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Modern Adventurer podcast. Coming up. Understanding how we can better conserve African elephants and an important part of that conversation right now is absolutely considering the fact that we aren't uh, effectively coexisting alongside them. So for those who may not know, listening that conflict with humans and elephants in uh, across Laikipia in Kenya is is a big issue, especially in the dry season. You know, there's excessive uh, fence breaking, excessive drop raiding, um, which leads to you know issues directly between humans and elephants. So. On today's show, we have Lizzie Daly, a wildlife biologist specialising in African elephants in Kenya. We talk to her about some of the incredible stuff that she's done in the last few years, travelling all over the world and seeing some of the most incredible things. I am delighted to introduce Lizzie Daly to the show. Thank you. (laughs) Good to be here. (laughs) So for the last three years, you've been travelling all around the world, going on these crazy sort of expeditions, filming, doing photography with wildlife. How did you get into doing what you're doing now? Oh, gosh, that could be a long-winded answer to that. Very good question. Um, But essentially, if kind of go back... Um, a few years even before I went to do my master's in in Bristol Um, for me it's always been about the wildlife and it's always been about wanting to be a scientist and someone who you know is is an expert if you like not a great word to use but someone who's just like very much involved in that world and for whatever reason as I started to do you know I knew I wanted to study animals and animal behavior so I started my degree at University of Exeter and I decided that telling stories about the natural world as well as being out there you know exploring it making the most of it and sharing that with others is absolutely what I want to do so the broadcasting world and the the my passion for the natural world kind of just combined in this ridiculous combination of of uh, what is now potentially a career you could say <laughs> obviously covid's hit but um yeah it's it's kind of resulted in uh, me being very lucky and having some incredible experiences with a variety of species across a variety of places and um, somehow calling it a bit of a job. Um, I'm also studying my PhD. So, you know, first and foremost, I, I am a scientist and I'm, I, I absolutely love wildlife first and foremost. I just get the absolute opportunity to go out and tell stories through presenting and filmmaking and taking photos too. <laughs> Amazing. And so you sort of got started with this. You're a wildlife biologist. Um, yes. What does a wildlife biologist do on a sort of daily basis? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I'm not sure you'd want to actually know because typically a wildlife biologist is like sat in front of a laptop and analyzing data <laughs> <laughs> or sat in a lab or analyzing data. But there is a fun side to um to studying wildlife as well you know you get to go out in the field um you get to so for me I'm I'm using tags and tag technology to better understand African elephant behavior so that has involved a few trips out to Kenya has involved learning more about some of the issues with African elephants in that landscape and um it will when COVID passes uh involve going out back in the field to deploy some more tags which is is very exciting but um to be honest, you know, it's a bit of bit of both. It is a bit of lab time. It is a bit of laptop time. And uh, uh, fingers crossed some more field time to come. <laughs> so you've spent quite a lot of time in Kenya um, with elephants. What, yeah, um, yeah. what uh, for people listening and people watching, what um, exactly you say you're sort of tagging them? Or are you more sort of looking at the communities that the elephants roam through? and sort of looking at how they can coexist? Um, Again, like really good question, just because my, so back in 2018 now, um, my initial interest in that area, I mean, you know, you know, knowing that Kenya landscape and some of the issues there with elephants um, was this coexistence, because for me, it's all about understanding how we can better conserve African elephants and an important part of that conversation 
right now is absolutely considering the fact that we aren't uh, effectively coexisting alongside them. So for those who may not know, listening that conflict with humans and elephants in uh, across Laikipia in Kenya is is a big issue, especially in the dry season. You know, there's excessive uh, fence breaking, excessive crop raiding, um, which leads to you know issues directly between humans and elephants. So when I went in 2018, I went to write my PhD proposal. I went to work alongside Space for Giants. And I really had just three months there to get my head around some of these issues and what, you know, what was really my passion and what I'm interested in. So in that respect, you know, in that time, I learned very quickly that it is very much all about community led conservation in that the whole picture is about people and elephants. However, you know, at the moment, if you were to ask me right now what, what my research is, um, it's very technical and I won't bore you with that in the next 40 minutes. But um, it's essentially understanding fine scale movements of African elephants. So the idea is that with this data that that collects so many points of, of data, even in a second, in every aspect of an elephant's movement, from that data, we'll be able to get um, important information about state. So state being whether an elephant perhaps is stressed or, you know, basically the internal drivers of behavior. So my current research is very behavioral focused and very focused on the animals themselves. But ultimately, that I hope will then lead on to looking at how we may better understand some of the elephants that, uh, and I put in inverted commas, problem elephants, uh, to to be able to prevent further issues with things like crop raiding and fence breaking. I suppose yeah. when people, because I know that Kenya, in the last sort of ten years, has had its issues with poaching. Mm. Um, I suppose people listening when they sort of see or hear about sort of elephants dying in Africa, they immediately, what springs to mind is poaching, but a lot of it's sort of focused around communities and elephants eating crops that they've planted, mm. destroying livelihoods. Where do you, I mean, yeah, sorry, where, where do you sort of see this sort of going? Because in the last hundred years, Kenya's population has gone from 2 million to 65 million. Mm -hmm. and is ever expanding and of course with the sort of growing population there space is becoming more and more constricted for the sort of movement of elephants which have these sort of ancient roots going through yeah yeah well i mean very two very good points there and that i think a lot of people don't think of conflict being the first issue and and the one that actually I think is glaring a lot of us in the face and we don't actually realize that unfortunately not just in Kenya you know with the largest land mammal on earth even here we're experiencing issues with conflict in overlapping habitats with wildlife we see an increase in number of urban foxes being pushed into urban areas even here on our doorsteps um but it, it's the same thing, right? It's this ongoing pressure on our wildlife, on our habitats, um, based on the fact that we are a growing world population. Where do I see it going? Um, I think there's a number of really, and I kind of want to stay positive with this because there are a number of really positive methods or mitigations, if you like. You know, you hear of the bee fences that some in some places it's really successful uh, putting basically a fence around crops made of beehives where that farmer, that local stakeholder can can um, can actually have the honey, sell on the honey. So it actually benefits them. And elephants hate bees. So it effectively or supposed supposed to effectively keep elephants out. Um, more long term mitigations are elephant proof fences, which can work. And also, oh, well, I'll come on to why they can't. But when they can work, it essentially um, is to allow elephants to roam free in areas where it's safe to do so without, you know, coming against local communities and destroying those livelihoods. The issue that you have is that you're dealing with a very intelligent, very social and constantly adapting species. Right. And some of the fence designs that they have tried previously, um, which are absolutely brilliant, haven't always been successful because elephants learn. They learn so quickly. And um, 
you know, so Space for Giants, who um, who I spent time with, there's uh, Dr. Lauren Evans, who's fantastic. She's uh, one of the one of the co-founders of Space for Giants. Uh, she set out camera traps, and they were looking at how elephants find all sorts of ways to climb over fences. You know, literally over them, they push down the fence. There's uh, supposedly sightings of these elephants army crawling like under these kind of metal poles that stick out from fences. So just incredibly well adapted and highly intelligent. Um, but ultimately, I think if we change our approach to basically, um, how do I put this into words? I think we should change our approach to look at how actually we live alongside these elephants. If we can create, for example, huge natural corridors, which are suitable for elephants, there will be no need to push into you know, areas of crops and, and come into areas of local communities. It's about, I guess, understanding that, yeah, we are a growing, especially in Kenya, you know, growing human population exponentially. But we need to start really thinking about how we can live alongside as opposed to living in conflict with. Um, that's a long winded way of saying it's not easy. There's lots of different short and long term ways, but we have to kind of we have to think of a solution, to be honest. Um, we've got to do it quickly. Yeah, I think my time out there, I there was a very good sort of case study in the Maasai Mara where I think back in sort of 1995 or something, one sort of uh, president in his election said that he would give land to all the Maasai Mara tribe. And of course, he gave them all 50 acres. They split, they mm. cut them up, put fence around them, and then the wildlife had nowhere to roam. And of course, yeah. it didn't really work. And so they implemented a sort of strategy of sort of community led, whereby they brought in tourism and there was always space for their cattle to roam in certain areas. And they all got yeah. their cattle together. And it was a very effective way of, um, what's the word? Effective way of keeping the game happy, thriving, and also their chance to have their cattle which are a huge part of their culture yeah. which they love yeah absolutely community-led con conservation is the way i mean when i was in um in loisaba conservancy you know one of the things they, they were doing there is taking out um local schools and showing them the wildlife that's on their doorstep and teaching them about how you know building a relationship with the wildlife on your doorstep is so important and and these are the ways that you can do it so yeah absolutely i guess the additional factor here is that and I'm sure you've seen this as well you know there's huge ecological pressures on places like Kenya like I was there in November 2019 and extreme flooding you know completely extreme flooding way early or way late in the season it was just yeah wiping out of course all these crops and all these necessary um, bits of land which otherwise would would actually not have the pressure of elephants on at that time of year so yeah lots to think about mm. um so in your sort of time out there um what were you sort of doing other than tagging were you sort of with the sort of different communities were you doing sort of with the rangers doing anti-poaching training or anything like that yeah so um i spent so again i was kind of with space for giants the whole time but within that um, I was looking at how Space for Giants have this model about how to conserve and what they do to effectively do that across across the region and with with the people of Kenya. So we went to Old Pajeta and looked at the anti -poach, poaching team there, and filmed with them, um, which were it's just absolutely fantastic. They're just such a brilliant team. And I guess Old Pajeta is is one of the more well known ones because of Sudan. The northern white rhino um, was in Old Pajeta, but they have a yeah. I got a taste of of kind of what it's like with with the drugs, uh, the the dogs there, the anti poaching dogs and their training in Old Pedge. Um, I went up to Loisaba Conservancy and learnt all about the collaring of the lions as part of a lion landscape project. Um, I also shadowed the Kenya Wildlife Service for a day and trans basically went on a translocation of three bull elephants that were being moved from the region. I think it was, um, I can't remember the name of the conservancy now. It's not far from Nanuki. Um, it's about an hour or so away. 
and they were being moved I think it was a hundred kilometers or so away because this one particular bull elephant kept on crop breeding, kept on returning to the same area. So he was being trans translocated by the Kenya Wildlife Service. So it, uh, to be honest, I just did a real mix of things as well as spending time in the field, IDing elephants, taking photographs, just loving Kenya really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. And um, you're you're quite a big runner as well, are you not? absolutely love it yeah i don't know what it is about just i'm i wouldn't say i'm a very good runner but i just really enjoy it you know just getting a bit muddy and having a good time <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i sort of see um on your social media you you're sort of out running in the countryside in the national parks absolutely have you, yeah. have you always yeah. been a big runner i have yeah i'd say kind of as i've got older my my running style or at least or at least what I enjoy more has changed so I've always enjoyed kind of going somewhere a little bit more wild off the beaten track if you like but I prefer kind of bigger bigger challenges and bigger routes and not ultra running but you know kind of heading more towards like something a bit more significant than a 5k around a local lake if you know <laughs> what I mean <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah. um because you did this uh trip in Portugal could you, yes. what happened with that? Yeah, so I uh, <laughs> I did um, the London Marathon when I was 19. And for me, that was like my first taste of like a bit of a longer run. And I absolutely loved the London Marathon. It was brilliant. Um, and thought, gosh, okay, let's try and like level it up. So I think the next year it was, I, I decided I'd run 72 miles through from Brecon, you know, down the um, Tafts Trail down to Cardiff so that was like another okay really enjoying this over a few days um and then I decided that I wanted to up it again so uh kind of packed a tent um picked a charity which World Land Trust I was raising money for at the time um and I to be honest I wanted to pick somewhere in Europe I think don't think a lot of people kind of go to think of Europe as a great place where you can kind of run off kind of off the beaten track and across beautiful places um or at least at the time I didn't and thought why not Portugal it's got an absolutely beautiful coastline it's a place that I've I've been to before and so I set out a 200 mile route down the coastline north to south and uh, just yeah just took a tent and off I went uh, and tried to do it in 10 days and died in the process <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was pretty brutal but great fun <laughs> Well, so what was your route sort of going from? Oh my gosh, I can't even remember now. Where was I? Hang on. I went to Port, I went Porto and then just went south from there. That was literally my route. I just picked Porto and was like, right, I'm going to go from here. And and pretty much just followed the coastline, you know. Um, my friend Rowan, who who isn't as just, yeah, uh, bonkers, brought a bicycle. She came cycling, cycled the last section of it with me um but otherwise it was like up at four you know trying to get get the runs in before it got too hot in the day and then just just basically camping out at night and making my way down down south it was really brilliant the habitats as well it was really nice because I kind of went through across beaches and really hidden towns and you know how beautiful Portugal is absolutely stunning place um but also through some like really fascinating small micro habitats like reserves along the coast so yeah, I'm really glad I picked Portugal. It was um, it was brilliant. <laughs> so what you just yeah, didn't take a map, or you just followed a route, or you just had a ba backpack on and just went right. Let's go. Pretty much, I picked Porto and was like, the coastline looks pretty good, and if the sea's on my right, then it should be fine. <laughs> you know, e each day after you run, you kind of pick out where's good or or. Um, a main route if you like but if I was to come across say like a nice boardwalk that would follow the coast closer than say through a town then I'd go do that I mean it was just me so I guess it, I'd had no you know race race director or a proper route to follow is it brilliant <laughs> it's quite nice having that sort of freedom to sort of pick and choose because when you're in a sort of marathon environment where it's competitive you're always you know, sort of thinking, all right, I've got to get on, got to get on. Like when you do these marathons around the sort of world, but when you sort of pick and choose and decide when and where, 
if you want to stop for an hour and be like, oh, this is actually really nice. There's no sort of yeah. pressure. And what were you doing? Yeah. Sort of covering 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers a day or? Yeah, I was kind of aiming for about 25 miles a day, which would, would make me kind of be within my 200. Well, initially it was 250 miles. Um, and I quickly decided that it wasn't going to be 250 <laughs> in 10 days. It was quite hot. So um, kind of like what you're saying, I had that flexibility <laughs> to say, all right, well, let's let's aim for 200 and enjoy it. So my aim was 25 miles a day. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I could just have that freedom to to pick a time where I want to start typically earlier rather than later before it got way too hot. But um, yeah, just lots of flexibility on the route and, and loving it along the way. The only thing is when you're, you know, really sore and just covered in blisters and bleeding from like strange armpit places and all the rest of it, it, it is a bit hard after a while, as I'm sure you know, that it's just like that motivation kind of dips at times. You have to kind of pull it together a little bit. <laughs> um, so, so you sort of just had your backpack and you carried, what, one set of clothes? And that was basically Yeah, it. no... I had like a few, yeah, I had a few bits and bobs. I mean, sometimes I, on on some of the days, I would come down a route and then there'd be like this really good access and like bus routes back and stuff. So I think it was two or three of the days that I was like, I, I kind of had all my, my gels, my water, all I needed. But then I kind of, after I finished my run, would just make my way back and then come back down the coast. Other days, I just had like my, my whole rucksack. It wasn't a lot. Uh, like a couple of running running bits and bobs and classes and all the rest of it and we make my way down and then my lovely friend Rowan would carry some of my stuff after that which is very good of us so yeah I suppose <laughs> on a bike it's a hell of a lot easier yeah she was having a lovely time like super lovely time I'm sure but um yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so also what was I going to say um I suppose for people listening where where do you sort of see the future of wildlife? Because as I say, with David Attenborough, you know, he came out mm. with his um, witness statement, and with thirty thousand species dying each year, what is probably for people listening? What is something do you feel that they can do that might just maybe help out a little bit? Yeah, such a hard question, you know. Um, in your day-to-day -day life, I guess, I think the one message that, you know, the likes of David Attenborough and these big blue chip documentaries and the likes of Greta Thunberg doing all her activist work, the main message is that you are responsible in everything that you do and your impact on the planet. You know, it may be a tiny impact. For example, you may or may not recycle. You may or not decide to cycle to work. It's a tiny little thing. But every little thing does add up. So I think the one message is that we are all in this together and we are all responsible in some way or another. Um, it's really up to you, I think, in how you want to, um, I guess, deal with that. But uh, it's hard because obviously in documentaries and things, you're, it's a very fine line between doom and gloom and being honest about the state of the planet. And, you know, without acting, beating around the bush we are we are actually in real trouble not only with the warming of the planet the loss of biodiversity loss um the destruction of our oceans you know I, I just the other day I was reading that so around the UK our marine protected areas um we have hundreds of them across the UK like 130 odd in Wales and 98 percent of our offshore MPAs actually experience you know extreme bottom bottom trawling and dredging which is like one of the most destructive yeah. activities that can take place in things like MPA. So um, I think, well, for a start, I just, I just think that even though conservation is doing everything it can, we need to do 10 times more. So whether you are a strict con uh, conservationist or whether you're someone who's just, you know, a mum at home, that's got kids, you need to get by day to day. You, you've got to, you know, you, that's not really your world. You still are responsible and very much part of that problem. So um as much as I want to say you know it's um we have to do everything we can it's also we have to be realistic about what can be done 
as long as everyone has the understanding that we all have a tiny part to play. So if you are in a position where you can, you know, walk to work or um, trade in your your diesel car for maybe an electric car or something, then do it, you know, do what you can. I'm not asking you to, you know, just live out of a mud hut and never speak to anyone again for fear of 5G. No, I'm joking. Uh, but... <laughs> Um, but it's it's all about being re- realistic and doing doing your bit. <laughs> it's a long winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very good. <laughs> um, so there's a part of the show where we ask. Well, I'd say the same five questions, but I've now changed them. So you're the first <laughs> okay. first batch. Um, okay. But I'm ready. On your trips, what's the one item or gadget that you always bring? Oh item or gadget okay it's a really nerdy one it's always a pair of binoculars always do you know for why you could be it could be out to go see whales you could be just on a hike you will always need a pair of binoculars and I know that's a really nerdy answer but um guaranteed someone will at some point go what's that then and then just out they come and it's like (laughs) the move do you have the sort of extra big or are they sort of like the little (laughs) Where are they? Let me get them. Hang on. I've got a few pairs. Where where are they? Oh no, they I don't oh well, these are my old ones. They're just like a classic, you know, you want something. There is actually a bit of an art and a skill to the right binoculars, depending on what you want. Okay. Mine are pretty standard. They need to be like, you know, a good pair of weighty binoculars. Let's see them. Just, Let's see them in action. You just can't go wrong. In action. <laughs> These are old now. I've got I've got some new ones, some new Leica ones. Leica ones are really brilliant, actually. But like... always a pair of binoculars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, what is your favourite adventure or travel book? Ooh. Adventure or travel book. Hmm. That's a really good question. I would probably lean more towards a wildlife guide (laughs) i tell you what only because it's one that i got recently and it's actually on the shelf behind me it's a naturalist's guide in nicaragua so it's a place where i've never been and um hang on let me get it (laughs) this is sending me on a, a whole thing it's by uh thomas belt and it's this really cool amazing like super old school um guide that he wrote about Nicaragua and it's just absolutely stuffed to the brim with everything about the place the people community like living the wildlife ideeing it is probably one of my my favorites my my latest favorites so a bit of a cheat there it's not quite a, an adventure book but it's close have you been no, this is no, this is partly why it's like so actually someone very close to me bought me this um because I saw it in a bookshop in Tenby, this like amazing bookshop that's just like stacked full of books, like about to topple over. It's absolutely beautiful. And um he actually got he actually got it for me and I've been obsessed with it ever since. But no, it's on the list. It's on the list. Have you been? I haven't been down there, no. Okay. Uh... Soon. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Well, so it'll be one of the one of the places I hope to go to in the future, but yeah. not at the moment. Not right now. <laughs> um, why are adventures important to you? Um, adventures are important to me because I am always, I always, I don't know, I always learn something new. There's always something surprising on an adventure. Um, I guess it's something that. I like being pushed outside my comfort zone. Is that a really cliche thing to say? But it yeah. it is. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cliche. Um, but I I always, yeah, it's something that's um, just always made me quite excited, inspired me. And uh, I'd say I'd encourage everyone and anyone, whether it's just like a small adventure on your local patch or um, somewhere further afield, Try and push yourself outside your comfort zone. Definitely, it's a really crappy answer. I'm sorry. No, no, it's very <laughs> good because I think I think everyone who comes on the podcast is very similar in that sort of mindset. Is you have a goal and then you push yourself and then you're like, oh, I 
I could have done that. That was yeah. I've done that. And then you sort of think, oh, okay, I'll take it a step further and further. And then once you've done that, you're sort of like, well, how far can I go? And, yeah, and- I've I've always got the best stories from my most strange adventures. Like there's um, funny enough, the, my last trip to Kenya, um, my friend James and I. So he was out as uh, he's part of my lab at Swansea University. He came out with me. We went out to go see wild dogs. Um, there's a small population. I'm sure some of your listeners will know. Maybe you know about the the wild dog population being depleted because of the the canine disease. So small population but um we were meeting up with this expert in a conservancy to go and basically go and track them and see if we can find them and we had about an hour left of light um so we had the option to either go back or go and see the wild dogs and of course it was like yeah we're going to go see wild dogs had the best encounter with them for about 10 minutes and then basically the flood the rains came we got flooded we couldn't get home we had to sleep in a random place in the middle of a conservancy and spent the next day trying to get back on Kenyan roads and getting broken down the whole time it was absolutely brilliant and what did I learn from that not much but wild (laughs) dogs are brilliant (laughs) wild dogs are great (laughs) I think always the best stories happen when there's sort of something disastrous happens because you're sort of like oh my god (laughs) you'll never guess what this happened (laughs) yeah yeah exactly (laughs) so uh Lizzie what is your uh, favorite quote well, just thinking on the spot, Don. Um, <laughs> no, I think, so I had this quote stuck to my wall. It's so cheesy, but um, why not? Uh, and the quote was, it was a day like this when Marco Polo left for China. What are your plans today? It's basically just saying that there is no better day than today. How about that bit of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, really liked it. Very good. <laughs> Um, people, people listening are always keen to travel and go on an adventure. What's the one thing you would recommend to them to, on how to become an adventurer or wildlife expert or Mm. biologist? Oh, okay. Different, I guess, different approaches there. Um, the one thing that I always think people miss when they just go on adventures is perhaps they don't tap into that. Um, you can be a naturalist and a biologist if you like at the same time so I would recommend for anyone that you know you may be a real lover of I don't know primary rainforest habitat just because it's epic and you love the scenery and you love trees or rainforests but you know really take the time to do your research or try and absorb your surroundings as much as you can and by doing that you know there's there's always lots of wildlife to see and always lots to learn about the environments that you're in so that would be my top tip on how to actually make the most of your adventure. It's just like, you know, really, really absorb all the all the information you can and then um, about your environment. And then to become a biologist, I think as long as you're a passionate, dedicated person, I don't think you actually need to go down the degree route. If you're not academically inclined, then absolutely fine. It may not be for you. But if you're someone who just loves the outdoors, like spend time outside spend time with a pair of binoculars and a, and a notebook and a guide and get to know again your your surroundings or you know contact organizations that you are passionate about or that you really enjoy working with and try and find ways to to get involved with them it's um there's lots of different routes into conservation and or into science um there's no like typical way don't get hung up on like having a degree uh but if that's also what you want to do then then sure go for it um yeah, that's my top tip. So research is key. Research is key. And actually what you find is that you enjoy the moments where you may be listening. You may just be in an environment and you hear, you know, I walk through Cardiff City Centre and I walk through and, yeah, you may think, gosh, there's nothing adventurous about that. But I can hear the peregrine falcons, like, screeching overhead and I'm just like walking through the city center and you're like, wow, that's the world's fastest bird. It's just gone over my head. And there's all these people around that have got no idea what they've just witnessed. So just, I don't know, just take that extra bit of time to really make the most of wherever you're going or, or how you're going to get there or who you're going to be with. And um, yeah, you'll enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and what are you doing now and how can people find you? So for now, I'm doing PhD st- 
stuff and um, trying to actually create some more online resources. So I've set up a series called Earth Live Lessons. It's basically 20 minutes of weekly lives with expert scientists, filmmakers from around the world. So you can find that on my YouTube channel at Lizzie Daily Wildlife TV. Otherwise, I'm just at Lizzie Daily Wild. And um, yeah, I'm posting something wildlife related regularly. So that's where you can find me if that's what you want or not. <laughs> Who knows? And um, what it, what's your plans when post-COVID, once this is all behind us? Um, okay, post-COVID... If that's this year, hopefully you've got a few uh, things lined up. I'm currently writing um, uh, like an, a, a wildlife adventure guide for the UK. So that's going to come out ne- later in the year. Um, hopefully, maybe, can't tell you too much, but something in Peru potentially uh, and heading back out to Kenya for some field work. So should things go back to normal, hopefully that's sooner rather than later. But you know what it's like right now. We'll just see. Amazing. Adapt. Well, Lizzie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to all your stories. And yeah, yeah go go check out uh, Lizzie Daly Wild. Wildlife or wild? Thank you. Wild. Wild. <laughs> wild. Whatever. Wild. <laughs>